بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله مرحبا بكم جميعا we continue with kun salafiyan ala al jadda be one who is salafi upon seriousness or some have translated be a serious salafi in the last class we left off covering the methodology of the people of innovation and desires and we covered wa alaykum assalam to Allah we covered that there are many causes of deviance and that which we covered were eight in number and to do a review the first matter that was mentioned was ignorance the second matter the following of the desires the third matter the affairs of innovation the fourth matter depending upon weak hadith the fifth matter using the intellect over the text the sixth matter having unregulated zeal and becoming like emotional in a manner that is not regulated by the legislation this can lead people to go astray number 7 being hasty in bringing about results and having a corrupt foundation and the eighth and the last matter that we covered not returning back to the well known scholars of al islam and all of that which has been mentioned from these eight affairs this is not something that is new rather just as these matters are causes of deviation in our time they were causes of deviation in the time of old When you look at the groups of deviants that appear amongst the ummah of al-Islam you find that they have with them some of these characteristics from the ignorance following desires innovation putting one's intellect before the text and other than that So now the Sheikh Hafizullah Ta'ala He brings the chapter Tariqul Khulas wan Najaa huwa bil ittiba 
وترك الابتداع The path of safety and salvation is by way of following, meaning following the sunnah. Following the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abandoning the affairs of innovation. قال الشيخ الإسلام في كتاب العبودية وجماع الدين أصلان ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نعبده إلا بما شرع شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية رحمه الله تعالى he mentioned in his book العبودية the essay of servitude he said that the deen of al-Islam, that which it is based upon, two fundamental principles. That which the deen is comprised of is based upon two fundamental principles. The first principle Allah na'buda illallah. We do not worship anyone except for Allah. The second principle, wala na'budahu illa bima shara'a. And we do not worship him except that which he has legislated. These two matters. Number one, al-ikhlas. Number two, tajreed al-mutabah lil-rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first matter, sincerity, al-ikhlas. The second matter, tajreed al-mutabah lil-rasul, meaning strictly following the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning in the affairs of ibadah, in the affairs of aqidah. In the affairs of dealings, in the affairs of character. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's the example. These two matters mentioned by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, this is the meaning of the two testimonies of faith. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. The actual meaning is, we're not going to worship anyone except for Allah. And we're not going to worship Allah except with that which He legislated. So we're not going to worship anyone except for Allah. That's Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness, none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah. And as for the meaning of Ashadu anna Muhammad al Rasulullah, I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. That means we're not going to worship Allah except with that which He has legislated upon the tongue of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> The Shaykh mentioned, لا نعبده بالبدع كما قال الله تعالى فمن كان يرجو لقاء ربي فليعمل عملا صالحا ولا يشرك بعبادة ربه أحدا He says, we do not worship Allah with innovation. Just as Allah Ta'ala mentioned, whoever hopes for the meeting with his Lord they let him work righteous actions and not associate anyone in the worship of his Lord. The ulama they mentioned that this verse entails the three conditions for actions to be accepted. Number one, al-iman, faith, and that's in the statement for man kana yarju liqa'a rabbi. Whoever hopes for the meeting with his Lord. No one hopes for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for the believer. فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Then let him work righteous actions. That's the condition of المتابعة, the following of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا And he does not associate anyone in the worship of his Lord. That's the ikhlas. The Shaykh mentions, 
فقد امر الله في هذه الايه ان يكون العمل صالحا اي موافقا للسنه ثم امر ان يخلصه صاحبه لله The Sheikh says indeed Allah has commanded in this verse that the actions be righteous meaning in accordance to the sunnah and then he commanded that the one who is performing the action that he makes the action sincerely for Allah طيب so we understand from the words of the Sheikh here that if there is an action that is not in accordance to the sunnah that action is not considered righteous it is corrupt <coughs> it's not صالح it's fasid it's corrupt it's mardud it's rejected because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stipulated in this verse how the act is supposed to be performed the action has to be a righteous action and the righteous action is not what the person himself sees to be righteous rather it is what is in accordance to legislation قال الحافظ ابن كثير في تفسيره الحافظ ابن كثير said in his tafsir and the scholars they encourage us that we read from the tafsir of Al-Hafid ibn Kathir specifically the abridged version, of, uh, version as well as the tafsir of Shaykh Abdurrahman ibn Nasir al-Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala Qala al-Hafid wa hathani rubna al-amal al-mutakabbal لابد أن يكون خالصا لله سوابا على شريعة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحافظ said these two matters are the two pillars of the accepted action it is a must that the action is done sincerely for Allah and correctly upon the legislation of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam In relation to these two matters the people are divided into four categories and we covered this before but the reminder benefits the believer the first category of people those who perform actions sincerely for Allah and correctly in accordance to the legislation. That's the first group. The second group are people who perform actions sincerely for Allah, but they are not done correctly in accordance to the legislation. The third group, those who perform actions correctly in accordance to the legislation, but the actions are not performed sincerely for Allah. And the fourth group, their actions are not done sincerely, nor are they done correctly. Only the first group will have their actions accepted from them. As al Habib ibn Kathir mentioned, Al-Amal al-Mutaqabbal, the accepted action. Because they are actions that are murdud, and actions that are accepted. So the first group of people, those whose actions are in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah performed sincerely, Allah will accept from them. As for the other three groups, their actions will not be accepted. وَقَدْ رُوِيَ مِثْلُ هَذَا عَنِ الْقَادِ عِيَاضِ رَحِمُهُ اللَّهِ وَغَيْرِ وَمِمَّا تَقَدَّمَ يَتَبَيَّنْ أَنَّهُ لَا بُدْ لِسِحَّةِ أي عمل نريد أن نتقرب به إلى الله من شرطين أساس أساس أساسيين ولا بد من وجودهما مجتمعين أو مجتمعين ولا ينفق أحدهما عن الآخر وهما إخلاص العبادة لله وحده 
وتجريد المتابعة لرسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. الشيخ mentioned the likes of this has been narrated upon al Qadi Iyad. May Allah have mercy upon him and other than him. And from that which has preceded, it has become clear that it is a must in order for the action or any action to be correct. That which we want to seek nearness to Allah with, it has to have or to fulfill the two conditions. The two main fundamental conditions. And it is a must that these two conditions are present together. Not having one without the other or none at all. You have to have these two conditions together. And one cannot be separated from the other. And they are making the acts of worship sincerely for Allah alone. And the mere following of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we understand from this, one action is not independent from the other, or one condition, I should say, one condition is not independent from the other condition. Because sometimes you hear the people, they make the statement, what well, individual, he's sincere. Now, it's good to be sincere, but that's not enough. Sincerity is not sufficient in order for the action to be accepted. Rather, both conditions have to be met. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-wise and the all-knowing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has legislated how he is to be worshipped. And these two points, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who legislates how he is to be worshipped. And these two pillars are from the legislation of Allah. It's ikhlas is from legislation. And following the legislation is from legislation. Sincerity is, is legislated, and following the legislation is legislated. From the proofs that we have to worship Allah based upon sincerity, the Sheikh brings the statement of Allah, فَعْبُدِ اللَّهِ مُخْلِصَ اللَّهُ الدِّينِ Therefore, worship Allah sincerely, making the entire religion for Him. Surah Al-Zumar. So Allah commands that we worship Him in what state? Mukhlisan. In the state of being a mukhlis. One who is sincere. A mukhlis is the one who practices ikhlas. Making the religion for Him. That's how it is known that the person is a mukhlis. That the person's entire practice of al-Islam, lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, is for Allah. It's not for the people. It's not for wealth. It's not for fame. Rather, that which one does from the acts of worship, whether it is salah or siyam, paying zakat, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, any act of worship, that a person performs, the individual who is mukhlis, he does it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Call Allah, وَبَتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْسَنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ Allah says, and seek in that which Allah has given you, the abode of the hereafter. And do not forget your portion from the life of this world. And do good as Allah has done good to you. So here we find the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use what He has given us from the life of this world to seek the hereafter. 
use the dunya to attain paradise. And do not forget your portion of the dunya, meaning there is no harm in an individual working to establish his worldly affairs. But from the beauty of this deen, that from the normal permissible actions, if a person has the intent and those normal permissible actions to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that normal permissible action now becomes an act of worship. So we strive for the hereafter using that which Allah has given us from the dunya and we do good in the life of this world seeking good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here also and do good as Allah has done good to you this is from displaying gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has done good to you so you do good. How do you do good in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sing out Allah with all acts of worship. Be sincere. That's the best good that a person can do <coughs> along with following the legislation. If an individual after receiving what he has received from Allah of bounties and then he goes and he associates partners with Allah. This individual has done evil in relation to the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, Ayyudham, Ayyudham, Which of the sins is the greatest? Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, An taja'ala lillahi niddan, wa huwa khalaqa. The Prophet Sallallahu said that the greatest sin is that you make for Allah an equal when it was Allah alone who created you. So here Allah did good to you, brought you into existence, provides for you. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has countless bounties upon mankind. Now the person, he goes and commits shirk. This is not ihsan in relation to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث القدسي الذي يرويه عن ربي أنا أغنى الشركاء عن الشرك فمن عمل عملا أشرك معي فيه غير تركته والشركة. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said in al hadith al qudsi meaning that which the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has narrated on his Lord. Allah said, I am the most independent of having partners associated with me. Therefore, whoever does an action, who associates other than me with me in that action, I abandon him and his act of polytheism. So here, the Prophet وسلم, is informing us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that he's the most independent of having partners. Meaning that th- throughout affairs you see individuals share things. As for Allah, he's independent from that. He's independent. And although people make partners with him, Allah is free from that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is self-sufficient and is not in need of any partners whatsoever. Allah is the most independent to have a partner associated with Him. So therefore, whoever does an action and He associates with me, meaning Allah other than me in that act, in that act of worship, I abandon Him in His act of shirk. This is the proof 
that if the action is not done sincerely, it is rejected. The Shaykhi says, so therefore, the matter of sincerity is not coupled along with polytheism or showing off or the person intending by his action the life of this world. He said, وَلَا بُوتْ أَنْ يَكُونَ الْعَامِلِ قَدْ قَصَرَ بِعَمَلِهِ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَ وَتَعَلَى وَحْدَى He says, however, it is a must for the one who is performing the action that his intention with the performance of his action is the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. هَذَا بِالنِّسْبَةِ لِمَا يَتَعَلَّقْ بِالشَّرْطِ الْأَوَّلِ This is in relation to that which is connected to the first condition. وَأَمَّا الشَّرْطُ الثَّانِي فَمَعْنَاهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ الْعَمَلَ الَّذِي نَتَقَرَّبُوا بِهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مُوَافِقًا لِمَا شَرَعَهُ اللَّهِ فِي كِتَابِهِ أَوْ سَنَّهُ رَسُولُهُ فِي سُنَنِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم As for the second condition, then the meaning of the second condition is that the action which we use to get close to Allah with, it has to be in accordance to that which Allah has legislated in His book or that which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has established in His Sunnah. So, these are the two matters. Legislation is from the book of Allah and from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And from the book of Allah and the Sunnah, we have the following of the Sahaba. قال الله تعالى اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم واتممتم عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا Allah states that this day I have perfected for you your religion and I have completed my favor upon you and I am pleased for you Islam as a way of life. So here Allah mentions three matters. Number one, the perfection of the religion. Number two, the completion of Allah's favor upon us. And number three, Allah being pleased with Islam as our way of life. So now, if the religion is perfected, then that means no one can add anything to it. If the, if the favor has been completed, then no one can come with some good or a favor that is not within Islam. Allah completed His favor upon us, a bounty. Someone is going to come with a bounty that's not in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then thirdly, Allah is pleased with us, Islam as our way of life. So whatever is other than al-Islam, Allah is not pleased with that. The Shaykh mentioned, فَقَدْ أَكْمَلَ اللَّهُ لَنَا الدِّينَ قَبْرَ أَنْ يَنْتَقِلَ الرَّسُولِ إِلَى الرَّفِيقِ الْأَعْلَى فَلَيْسَ هُوَ بِحَاجَةِ إِلَى مَنْ يَزِيدِ وَيَنْقُصْ فِيهِ He says, indeed Allah has completed for us the religion before the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to the high lofty uh, status. How do they have it translated here? Highest, the highest abode. The highest abode. So therefore, the person is not in need. For the one who will add or take away in this religion. Not in need of anyone to bring anything to you that's not from the religion. And you're not in need for anyone to take anything away from the religion. The religion is fine just as it is. Leave it. Just follow. There's no room and no allowance for people to add anything to our deen. Because if the door is opened up for people to add, then this means, number one, the religion is not complete and perfect. <clears throat> number two, the door is open for additions. Then, 
But what happened to us is what happened to the previous nations. Due to the people involving in the affairs of innovation, the truth was lost. <coughs> Another matter in relation to if the door is open to innovation, this will cause separation amongst the Muslim Ummah. Why? Because each person will come with his own view of what we should act. And then that will lead to argumentation and differing. Which will lead to the separation of the hearts. But being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed the religion and perfected the religion, and we just command it to follow, this is where the unity is at. Because everyone is supposed to be doing the same thing. Not you have your own way, and this one has his own way. You know, I remember when we was young, you know, remember on Sesame Street, you have like five kids there. Four kids jumping rope, and then one person bouncing the ball. And the guys in the back are saying, one of these kids is doing his own thing. But we don't have that in Islam. Everybody's supposed to be doing the same thing. We have the same Quran, we have the same messenger. The methodology is one. Not one individual staying away from the people of innovation because this is the way of the Salaf and then another person, he mixing with the people of innovation. No. Everybody's supposed to be on the same methodology. But due to people involving themselves in innovation, this is why you see the separation. Because these individuals who involve the innovation and deviate, they have their own ideology. They have something that's added to the religion that's not from it. So it takes them away from that which they're supposed to be doing. Imam Malik, he said about this verse, whoever innovates something into this religion, seeing it as being something good, then he has insinuated or claimed that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi betrayed the trust that was given to him. And wallah, that's, that's a serious statement from Imam Malik, rahimahullah. Because when somebody is innovating, it's like they're saying that there's something missing from the religion. So if there's something missing, are you saying that the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell us everything? See, that's where the claim is at. And look at this point. A person doesn't have to verbally say something in order for it to be a claim. Listen to me how this ayah. I didn't make that. I didn't. I didn't say you did such and such. No, but your actions are indicating that. The position you're taking is indicating that. Right? Even some of the words that you're saying or writing is indicating that you're claiming something. So you know, Malik is saying whoever innovates in the religion, seeing that as being something good, then this individual has claimed. That the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi betrayed the trust. Now if you go to an innovator, you say, are you saying that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam betrayed? He would say, no, I'm not saying that. But indeed, with the practice of innovation, that is the claim. So he said, مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ دِينَا فَلَا يَكُمْ يَوْمَ دِينَا So whatever was in the religion on that day is not the religion today. The Shaggy says, وَقَدْ جَاءَتْ نُصُوصٌ كَثِيرَةٌ تَأْمُرْ بِالْإِتِّبَاعِ وَتُحَذِّرْ مِنَ الْإِبْتِدَاعِ وَالْإِحْدَاثِ فِي الدِّينِ He says, there has come many texts that command us with the following, meaning following the legislation, and warn from following the legislation and warning from involving oneself in the newly invented matters in the religion. قال الله تعالى لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا that indeed you have within for you within the messenger of Allah a beautiful example for the one who holds the meeting with Allah in the last day and he remembers Allah much. So we benefit from this that the Messenger is the best example for us 
We want to know what kind of Muslims we should be. We look at the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How to put every matter, how we show gratitude, how we pray, how we fast, how we pay zakat, how we make hajj, how do we deal with the people of deviation? Everything we find in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So one can't claim that there is no guidance or that a matter is unknown and there is no direction because Allah mentions that in the Messenger of Allah you have a beautiful example that's general it means in all affairs He didn't say uh, in the relation to the Salat or in the Messenger of Allah you have a beautiful example in how to make Hajj and then then it would, been, it would have been restricted to Hajj in that verse had the mentioning of Hajj been there or Salah or Siyam no, Allah left it general meaning in all of the affairs in the life of the Muslim the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a beautiful example and this is for the one who holds to the meeting with Allah in the last day so the stronger the individual's desire is to meet Allah and to be in the paradise and the hereafter, the more this individual follows the Prophet ﷺ. When you find an individual deviating from the way of the Prophet ﷺ, if the individual is still a Muslim, although he's deviant, that shows that there's a deficiency in the person's hope for Allah in the last day. And there's a deficiency and that individual remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as for the individual who has apostated from the religion due to his deviance, then this individual has no hope for the meeting with Allah in the last day. Call Allah ta'ala, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولِ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ And whatever the messenger gives you, take it. And whatever the messenger forbids you from, abstain from it. Make a note for this ayah right here. This ayah right here is the proof from the Quran for every hadith. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an he had cursed the woman the woman who tattooed themselves or they get tattooed the one who do the tattooing and putting the artificial gap between the teeth and cut the eyebrows Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he cursed these women so a woman she heard about this so she said to him, do you curse those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not cursed? So he said, have you read the book of Allah? She said, yes. He said, indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed these women. She said, I read the book of Allah from cover to cover. And I do not find in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed these women. He said, did you not read the statement of Allah, whatever the messenger gives you, take it. Whatever he forbids you from abstaining from it, she said, yes. And he said, indeed, I heard the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mention, may the curse of Allah be, and he mentioned. So here Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used this ayah to prove this hadith. So whenever someone says, well, where is that in the Quran? In relation to a hadith, we say, call Allah ta'ala, wa ma atakum al-rasul faqudhuh, wa ma nahakum anhu fantuhu. Whatever the messenger gives you, take it. Whatever he forbids you from abstaining from. But this is the understanding of the Sahaba. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. See, that's why it's important for us to follow their way. See how he used the ayah to prove a hadith. Now, so in reality, generally speaking, every hadith, I meaning authentic hadith, that was authentically reported on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every authentic hadith is in the Quran because of this verse. Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah ta'ala 
He said, you find some people, they say, well, we haven't found that this matter is specifically mentioned in the Quran. And this matter is mentioned in the Quran specifically, on the Hadith specifically. Constantly looking for something, a specific wording to prohibit a matter. When you have the general text that prohibit. Tayyip. Sheikh al says, let me ask you, and he's speaking in his lecture. He said, is marijuana halal or haram? He said, haram. So do you find the prohibition or the mentioning of marijuana specifically in the Quran? He said, let me ask you, opium. This is permissible and permissible. He said, it's impermissible. He said, but do we find opium being mentioned specifically in the Quran? No, not by name. But we have in the Quran general text as well as in the Sunnah general text that prohibit any type of intoxicant. So no matter what the name of that intoxicant is, it's going to fall under that prohibition. And this is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from the knowledge of Allah. Allah's knowledge is vast. Allah's knowledge is complete. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated legislation and completed it in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, over, over 1400 years ago, but yet it's still applicable today. That's what, that shows you that this book was not written by a man, or come, it's not the words of a man. It's not the words of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. As the Orientalists, they claim the Prophet learned from the, a Jew, he learned from a Christian, and he just came up with his own theories. That's what they, the Orientalists and adversaries of Al Islam say the Quran is. No, the Quran is the speech of Allah. And how do we know that? Because from then until now, it's still applicable. Right? The Prophet didn't know the future, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, unrestrictedly. He only knew what Allah informed him of. Right? But yet, these rules and regulations are applicable for all times and all places and all situations. Qala Allah Ta'ala Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhbibukum Allah Say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me and Allah will love you. This verse is known as Ayatul Imtihan, the verse of the test. It was mentioned by Al Hassan al Basri that there were some individuals who claimed to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah tested them by commanding them with the following of the Prophet. <coughs> So the more one follows the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more the individual has love for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But understand this important point. The matter is not that you love Allah. But the matter is that you are loved by Allah. <laughs> Again, the matter is not that you love Allah, but the matter is that you are loved by Allah. Because not everybody who loves Allah is loved by Allah. But everyone who Allah loves, loves Allah. So if you are loved by Allah, then that establishes your love for Allah. But just because you love Allah doesn't establish Allah's love for you. So how do we attain the love of Allah? The following of the Prophet Muhammad The Shaykh, he says, وَمِنَ السُنَّةِ A hadith kathira minha qawluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdiyi min ba'di عضوا عليها بالنواجذ وإياكم ومحدثات الأمور فإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, upon you was following my way, 
in the way of the rightly guided Khulafa. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and Al Hassan. Right? Why are you looking at me like that? Yes or no? You agree? What's the proof? Because uh, he was the he was the Khalifa after Uthman. I'm after Uthman. Ali is the Khalifa. I mean, I'm after Ali, when the uh, fitna between Ali and Muawiyah. Before that, he was the one who solved it because he became the Khalifa. And he but how is he from, from amongst the right? They got the Khulafa. What's the proof of that? Oh, the proof. Who has the proof? Yes. Um, Ali was, was assassinated by the Khawarij, and Has- Al Hassan, he held on to the uh, Khalifa for, for the six months to complete the 30 years. There's a hadith. The Prophet said that said the Khilaf of prophethood is for 30 years. Oh, okay. And Hassan, Al Hassan's term. It ends that 30 years. So the scholars mentioned he is amongst the Khulafa al Rashidin. Wallahu okay, okay. No. Hayyib. Mm-hmm. He said, Bide on to it with your molar teeth. Showing that the Sunnah of the rightly guided Khulafa is in agreement with the Sunnah of the Prophet. Sallallahu and be aware of newly invented matters. For every newly invented matter is innovation, every innovation. Is going astray and every going astray is in the hellfire. Wa kawluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Turatu fikum Ma in tamasaktum bihi lam tadillu ba'di Kitab Allah wa sunnati The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said I left amongst you that which if you was to hold on to it You will never go astray The book of Allah and my sunnah So the means of protecting ourselves from misguidance is holding on to the Quran and the Sunnah. When you find that someone has deviated in any shape, form, or fashion, know that it is due to some form of abandonment of the Quran and the Sunnah. A lack of practice of the Quran and the Sunnah. Every every type of deviance. Because the Prophet mentioned if you hold on to it, you will never go astray. So now if somebody has strayed, then it is due to them leaving off something from the Quran and the Sunnah, which has led to them deviating. And no, a person does not have to leave off every single affair to deviate. It can be one matter from the principles of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah that a person deviates because of. وَلِهَذَا الْإِجْتِمَاعَ هُوَ الْإِعْتِصَامَ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّةِ رَسُولِهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ F1, F1, I'll skip the part. وَقَوْلُهُ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ مَنْ عَمِنَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ in the statement of the Messenger of Allah, whoever does an action that does not have our affair over it, it is rejected. This narration here is for the one who performs the action, and the other one, man ahdatha fi amri nahada ma laysa minu fuhurad. That's for the one who initiated it. So, because sometimes a person may say, I didn't initiate this, I'm just following what I was taught. <coughs> this narration mentioned here is for that. And as for the one who initiated it, the other narration is for the one who initiates the deviance. So the initiator of the innovation and the follower of the innovation, both of them, their actions are rejected in relation to that innovation. وَقَدْ أَمَرَ اللَّهُ الْأُمَّةِ بِالْإِجْتِمَاءِ وَاتِّحَادِ وَاتِّحَادِ الْكَلِمَةِ عَلَى أَنْ يَكُونَ الْأَسَاسِ لِهَذَا الْإِجْتِمَاءِ هُوَ الْإِعْتِصَامِ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّةِ رَسُولِهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ 
ونهى عن التفرق وبين خطورته على الأمة وليتحقق هذا الأمر فقد أمرنا بالتحاكم إلى كتاب الله في الأصول والفروع ونهينا عن كل سبب يؤدي إلى التفرق The Sheikh mentioned Allah has commanded the Ummah with being united and uniting their word upon and the uniting of their word. Now, Allah has commanded the Ummah with uniting or being together and uniting their word upon that the origin or the foundation of this unity is holding on to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Allah has prohibited us from separating from one another and he has clarified the harms and the evils upon this ummah of us separating so in order to make this commandment a reality or to actualize this commandment Allah has commanded us to returning back to his book for judgment and the fundamental principles as well as the branches and we have been prohibited from every matter that leads to separation if there is any unity upon other than the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the understanding of the Sahaba that unity will not last mm-hmm. understand that and sometimes ikhwa, it takes a while for the unity to come together because there are matters that are present that has to be removed first before that unity could take place meaning matters that are in opposition to the Quran and the Sunnah if we just unite, just so we can say that we're united and we're together, but those issues that are in opposition to the Quran and Sunnah are present, the reality is that the separation is still there. Because the hearts are not united, which is eventually going to lead to the physical uh, separation. So now, unity is a fundamental principle of this religion. We do not deny this. However, we're not commanded to unite upon anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions as the Shaykh, He brings the verse, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold on all together to the rope of Allah and do not be divided. So the unity is based upon holding on to the rope of Allah. Not just uniting upon anything just because we all say we're from Ahl Sunnah, no. Us saying we're from Ahl Sunnah is one thing, and then following the fundamental principles of Ahl Sunnah, that's another thing. Because it's not just a matter of a claim, as the Sheikh mentioned, and as we covered in the previous lessons. It's not just a claim, this is a practice. It's the positions that we take to establish our claim. If that practice is not in place, but we have the claim, there's not going to be unity. It's not going to be unity. So those who strive to rectify the affairs by commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, mentioning what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, mentioning what the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, taking a stance that is in accordance to the Quran and sunnah with the understanding of the Sahaba, that which has been taught by the scholars, this is the path that we have to use to bring about unity. This is where the true unity is. Not upon just saying we're together or outwardly showing force and numbers and the likes. No, that, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. And sometimes people get caught up in that. The numbers, just showing... You know, a, a sign of force. But now, this individual is cursing this individual in his heart. And we don't need that. We don't need that. So 
So holding on to the kitab and the sunnah, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with the understanding of the sahaba, this is how the unity will last. Other than that, it will not last. It may not even take place in the first place. This is a very important point the Sheikh has mentioned. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop at this point and we'll take a short break and then we will come back and complete the chapter. Inshallah ta'ala. سبحانك اللهم وحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد So the Shaykh Hafidahullah Ta'ala he mentioned an important point and that is that the true unity is the unity that is based upon the Kitab and the Sunnah. As for unity that is based upon other than the Kitab and the Sunnah it will not last, it will not stand. We have to keep away from all of that which leads to separation. And from the things that lead to separation, shirk, bid'ah, and ma'asi. Polytheism, innovation, and sin. Allah mentioned قَدْ كَانَتْ لَكُمْ قُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُمْ إِذْ قَالُوا لِكَوْمِهِمْ إِنَّا بُرَآءٌ مِّنْكُمْ وَمِمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ لَهُ Indeed you have a beautiful example in Ibrahim and those with him. When they said to their people, Indeed we are free from you and free from that which you worship besides Allah. So you see now, what caused that separation? The shirk. So Ibrahim and those with him, they separated themselves from the people because they were upon shirk. طيب. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, مَنْ رَغِبَا أَنْ سُنَّةِ فَلَيْسَ مِنْهِ Whoever desires other than my sunnah, he is not from me. Showing that following other than the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ will cause separation from the people of the Sunnah. And the other affairs we find from the Prophet ﷺ warning against the people of innovation and innovation. And likewise sins. <coughs> from the narration that is mentioned by Al-Imam Al-Bukhari in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. ما تحابثنان في الله فيفرق بينهما إلا ذنب أحدثه أحدهما أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم There will be nothing that will separate between two people who love each other for the sake of Allah except for a sin that one of them has committed Sins cause separation Should cause separation Innovation cause separation. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, that doesn't cause separation. That brings about unity and strengthening the ranks of the Muslims. Why do you think that the Prophet and the Sahaba, they were one tight unit? Because the Prophet corrected the errors whenever they happened. Right? Look at the sunnah. So many examples. Prophet, correct this one. Correct that one. He didn't leave those matters to be because if those matters were left, it would lead to separation. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi corrected those affairs. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala corrected those affairs in the Quran to what? <coughs> Preserve the unity. وَحَبْلُ اللَّهِ هُوَ أَهْلُ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ الْقُرْآنِ كَمَا قَالَ الْمُفَسِّرُونَ 
وقد أمر الله بالجماعة ونهى عن الفرقة والاختلاف كما قال تعالى وما أتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا He said the rope of Allah is the covenant of Allah and the rope of Allah is the Quran just as the scholars of Tafsir have stated and Allah has commanded us with the jama'ah and He has prohibited us from separation and differing just as Allah Ta'ala mentioned whatever the messenger gives you take it whatever he forbids you from abstaining from meaning the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has commanded us with being united upon the truth and he has forbidden us from separation Shaykh says and this entails the fundamental principles of the religion and its branches that which is outward and inward and indeed that which the messenger came with it is obligatory upon each and every individual from the servants to take it and to follow it and it is not permissible for the servant to oppose that which the messenger sallallahu was selling brought and that which the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned in relation to the ruling of a matter it is similar to the text that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning that the Quran and the Sunnah is the same in relation to revelation, relation to revelation and legislation meaning the Quran is revelation the Sunnah is revelation the Quran has within it rules and regulations we have to follow likewise the Sunnah has rules and regulations we have to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned Ala inni utitu al-Qur'an wa mithlahu ma'a Indeed, I have been given the Qur'an and it's like along with it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam resembled the Sunnah to the Qur'an meaning from the aspect of it being revelation and from the aspect of it being the source of legislation. As we know without a doubt the Qur'an is the speech of Allah which is not created. And that's not so in relation to the Sunnah. We understand that. And that's speaking from this bab. But from the bab of it being wahi, from the bab of it being the shara, the legislation, we have to accept that. Because you have some individuals that say, well, that's not in the Quran. Oh, that's some hadith. You cannot practice Islam without hadith. It's impossible. Even the individuals, they call themselves the Qur'anis, the Qur'aniyun. They're the Shaytaniyun. They're not the Qur'anis, they're the Shaytanis. Because how in the world they consider themselves the people of the Qur'an, <coughs> right? When the Qur'an commands the following of the Messenger of Allah. That's one point. The second point, they're not even truthful in their claim of only following the Qur'an because if they make Salat, the details of the Salat is in the Sunnah, it's not in the Qur'an. From reciting Fatiha and every Raka'ah, saying Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, wa in Ruku'ah, saying Sami Allahu Liman Hamid Rabbana, that's all in the, the Sunnah, the Hadith. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, putting your finger out, making the Tasharhud, making the Tasli. These matters are in the Sunnah. The details of the Salat in the Hadith. You can't get around that. And Sheikh says, لا رخصة بأحد في تركه There is no concession for anyone to abandon that which the Messenger has brought, صلى الله عليه وسلم. ولا يجوز تقديم قول أحد على قول الله And it is not permissible to give precedence to the statement of anyone over the statement of Allah. Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ That's Surah Al-Hujurat, verse number one. All you who believe, you, should, you put that in there, with, with the Sheikh mentioned that point, and do not give precedence to any one statement over the statement of Allah, put Surah Al-Hujurat, verse one. Surah 49, verse one. The Sheikh didn't mention it here, in the book. The Sheikh didn't mention it in the book, but you put it in there. The, the statement we have put in the parentheses 49 1. 
Surah Al-Hujurat, verse 1. All you who believe, do not put yourselves before Allah and His Messenger. What is meant by don't put yourself before Allah and His Messenger, meaning don't believe anything, don't do anything, don't say anything in this religion until you know what Allah and His Messenger have stated. قال الله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله ورسوله ولا تولوا عنه وأنتم تسمعون All you who believe, obey Allah and, the mess- and obey Allah's messenger and do not turn away from him while you hear Or do not, do not turn away from him while you hear Don't turn away from the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't turn away from the obedience of the messenger when you hear the Quran and when you hear the sunnah, no, the, the, the statement of the believers, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear, we obey. وَقَدْ أَمْرَنَا اللَّهِ عِنْدَ التَّنَازُعَ بِالرَّدِّ إِلَى كِتَابِهِ وَإِلَى سُنَّةِ رَسُولِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الله تعالى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِعُوا الرَّسُولِ وَأُولِي الْأَمْنِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنْ تَنَزَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فُرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر ذلك خير وأحسن تأويلا. All you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority from amongst you. And if you differ in anything, refer back to Allah and the Messenger. If you are truly believe, if you truly believe in Allah in the last day, and that is better and more suitable for a final determination. This verse is general, meaning in anything that we differ in. We are to refer back to Allah and the Messenger. Why? Because perfection and protection is in the Quran and the Sunnah. You can't go wrong. If the religion is complete and protected and perfected, then why not go back to that which is perfect instead of taking a chance with that which is not perfect and subject to error? And this is the problem. When we have issues of differing amongst ourselves, and it's good that the Sheikh brought this, because after the Sheikh mentions the importance of being united, the Sheikh brings the issue of referring back to the Quran and Sunnah. We differ, showing that being united doesn't mean that we're never going to differ amongst one another. Right? The Sahaba were united, and they differed in some matters. Not Aqidah, but they differed in some matters. No, it's no, not Aqidah. And they differ in some matter, but not the Aqidah. But whatever they differ in what they do, go back to Allah's Messenger. And that was that that pres- them going back to Allah's Messenger would preserve the unity. The, what will break the unity is when we don't go back to Allah's Messenger. And everyone wants to come with their own solution. That's a problem. قال ابن كثير رحمه الله أطيع الله يعني فاتبعوا كتابة. So the statement of Allah, obey Allah, this means follow His book. وأطيع الرسول أي خذوا سنته أي اتبعوا سنته. And obey the messenger means take his sunnah, meaning follow his sunnah. وقول الأمر منكم إن those in authority from amongst you أي فيما أمروكم به من طاعة الله لا في معصية الله فإنه لا طاعة لِمَخْلُوقٍ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ And those in authority from amongst you, meaning, as the scholars mentioned, الْأُمَرَى وَالْعُلَمَى وَالْعُلَمَى وَالْأُمَرَى The scholars and the rulers. This is the meaning of, and those in authority from amongst you. The scholars and the rulers. And some of the ulama have mentioned, this is just referring to the Muslim rulers. Now. So, it says, so Ibn Kathir says, in that which they have commanded you with, from the obedience of Allah, not in that which is disobedience to Allah. For indeed there is no obedience to creation and disobedience to the Creator. And that is actually the wording of an authentic hadith. لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience to creation and a disobedience to the Creator. فَإِنْ تَنَزَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فُرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ أي إلى كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهذا أمر من الله 
بأن كل شيء تنازع الناس فيه من أصول الدين وفروعه أنه يرد المتنازع فيه إلى الكتاب والسنة After the statement of Allah and if you differ in anything then refer it back to Allah and the Messenger meaning refer it back to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his Messenger وسلم, This is a commandment from Allah that every matter that the people have differed in from the fundamentals of the religion and the branches of the religion that all of that يُرَدْ الْمُتَنَازَعْ فِيهِ يُرَدْ الْمُتَنَازَعْ فِيهِ إِلَى الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ That which is being differed about is to be returned back to the kitab and the sunnah. And wallahi, the people will be better off if we just practice this right here. If we were to just really refer our matters back to the Qur'an and the sunnah. And from the Qur'an and the sunnah is what? فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge when you don't know. <clears throat> Ask the people of knowledge. Seeking direction. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not command who tried to deceive the people of knowledge. No. Ask the people of knowledge. Ask. With sincerity. Because you want the knowledge so that you can implement and not asking one scholar to get one ruling to see if it's going to agree with your desires and then if it don't, we're going to go over here. If the sheikh don't give us what we want, we're going to go to another sheikh. No, no, that's not Islam. That's not the way of Allah Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Kema qala Allah Ta'ala وَمَا اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَحُكْمُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ And just as Allah has mentioned, and whatever you differ in regarding any matter, its ruling is to Allah. Its ruling is to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَا حُكْمُ فَمَا حَكَمَ فِيهِ الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَالشَّاهِدَ لَهُ بِالصِّحَّةِ فَهُوَ الْحَقِّ فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ So whatever the Quran and the Sunnah has judged regarding that matter, and the Quran and the Sunnah has testified to the correctness of that matter, then that matter is the truth. And what is after the truth except for misguidance and falsehood? There's no... The truth is one matter. Falsehood and deviance is, is many. Right? What's the proof? Allah says, Allahu waliyu ladina amanu yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumati ila al-nur wa ladina kafaru awliyaahum al-tagood يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظُّلُمَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدٌ Allah has mentioned, Allah is the wali, the guardian, the protector of who? Those who believe. What does he do? Take them out of darkness. Darkness here is in the plural. يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ He didn't just say مِنَ الظُّلُمْ No, مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ Darkness. Right? Darkness meaning in the plural sense is more than one. Showing that falsehood has more than one face. Falsehood has more than one path. So he takes them from the falsehood and takes and from the falsehood meaning in the darkness in the plural and puts them into the light. Light here is in the singular. Showing the truth is one. And those who disbelieve, their guardians are the Targut. The Targut takes them from the light, that one truth, and enters them into the different types of darkness. Those are the companions of the hellfire to abide therein forever. Likewise, the Hadith, the Prophet drew one line on the floor and said, This is the path of Allah. Then he drew other lines on the side. 
So these different separated paths at the head of each path there's a shaitan calling to it. Showing that the truth is one. But the paths of deviance and misguidance are many. So there's nothing after the truth except for misguidance. There's not going to be another truth. And the truth doesn't contradict itself. You have truth and you have falsehood. So follow the truth and abandon the falsehood. ولهذا قال الله تعالى إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر and that is if you believe truly believe in Allah in the last day <coughs> meaning that those who truly believe in Allah in the last day <coughs> They refer all matters of dispute and matters that are not known back to the Kitab and the Sunnah for the decisive judgment, for the deciding judgment. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَرْجِعِ إِلَيْهَا فِي ذَلِكَ فَلَيْسَ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ And whoever doesn't return back to the kitab and the sunnah in that affair, then this person is not one who believes in Allah in the last day. This has two meanings. Either the person doesn't believe in Allah in the last day at all, or the person doesn't believe in Allah in the last day with complete iman, depending on the individual. Sometimes a person doesn't want to return back to the Quran and the Sunnah because that person believes that there is something else better than the Quran and the Sunnah. That person has apostate. For thinking that there is something better than Allah's book and better than the Prophet's Sunnah. That's kufr. As for the one who knows that the best judgment is in the book of Allah and in the Sunnah, but the individual is weak follows his desires. So he goes to other than that, this individual doesn't believe in Allah in the last day with complete iman. His iman is deficient. So this is the meaning of that statement of the shaykh. It has two meanings. So don't just understand it one way. It depends on the individual. Then he mentions, ثُمَّ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ ذَمَّ التَّفَرُّكَ وَنَهَا عَنَ التُّرُكَ وَالْأَسْبَابَ الْمُؤَدِّيَةِ إِلَيْهِ وأنه من أعظم أسباب الخذلان في الدنيا والعذاب في الآخرة قال الله تعالى ولا تكونوا كالذين تفرقوا تفرقوا واختلفوا من بعد ما جاءهم البينات وأولئك لهم عذاب عظيم يوم تبيض وجوه وتسود وجوه قال ابن عباس تبيض وجوه أهل السنة والجماعة وتسود وجوه and then Allah indeed has blamed the affair of separation. Meaning blameworthy separation. When people are separating not based upon the truth. As for those who separate from a people because of the heart that's not blameworthy. And don't ever be ashamed of that. Ibrahim alayhi salam, they separated from the polytheists. The Prophet sallallahu he separated from the polytheists. The Prophet sallallahu commanded us to be aware of every newly invented matter, meaning we separate ourselves from that. The Sahaba freed themselves from the people of innovation, although they were Muslims. So now someone's going to come and say, oh man, the people commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, this is causing separation amongst the Muslims. They mean in a blameworthy manner. No, there's praiseworthy separation and there's blameworthy separation. Blameworthy separation is that separation is not based upon kitab and the sunnah. It's based upon personal matters. Personal agendas. Dunya we affairs. No, no, we don't separate over those type of issues. As for religious matters, yes. Yes. Why? For the preservation of the religion.
So he said, indeed Allah has blamed, separation has prohibited the paths and the means which lead to separation. Meaning blame with this separation. And that it is from the greatest of the reasons which bring about abandonment in the life of this world as well as in the hereafter. Allah Ta'ala he stated, and do not be like those who separated and differed after clarity came to them. What are you supposed to do after clarity comes? You're supposed to follow the clarity, not go into more separation. But this is the problem with the people. Clarity comes, people differ. So how? The matter is clear, the proof has come. Leave off what you were upon, follow the truth. Let it go. Let the falsehood go. Because if you hold on to the falsehood in the wrong position, it's going to lead to more separation. But yet these same individuals, they say, well, we want unity, but you're not leaving off your position of wrong. It can't be unity. Those are the ones who have for them a great punishment. Why? Because they separated after the guidance came. Meaning they know better. The truth came to you, you know better, but you still do the opposite. It's a painful punishment for that type of individual because he has went astray on knowledge. He know better. The day when faces will be white and on a day when faces will be black. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, the faces of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'at will be white and the faces of Ahlul Bid'ah and separation will be black and dark. So here, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that there's going to be a difference between the faces on Yom Al-Qiyam and Abdullah ibn Abbas, the one who the Prophet said, take the Quran from, is saying that the faces of Ahlul Sunnah will be white and the faces of Ahlul Bid'ah will be black, then how can someone who claims to be from Ahlul Sunnah have a working relationship with the people of innovation in relation to religious matters? You claim that you're with the group whose faces are going to be white on your Mokayama, but you're working with the people whose faces are going to be black on your Mokayama. قال الله تعالى إن الذين فرقوا دينهم وكانوا شيعا لست منهم في شيء إنما أمرهم إلى الله ثم ينبئهم بما كانوا يفعلون Indeed those who separate their religion and there are different groups and parties you're not, you have nothing to do with them and indeed their affair is to Allah and then Allah will inform them of that which they used to do so those who separate in their religion by way of bringing about an aqidah that's different from the aqidah of the Prophet ﷺ. Bringing about acts of worship that are different from the acts of worship of the Prophet ﷺ. Bringing about a methodology, a manhaj that is different from the manhaj of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. This is separating in their religion. Those who do this and they break into parties and groups and this group over here, we don't have nothing to do with them. Just like Allah told the Prophet, you have nothing to do with them, we don't have nothing to do with these groups. This is the proof that is not permissible for us to work with the people of innovation. And those who are with the people of innovation, the aid the people of innovation, we have nothing to do with them. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم ألا إن من ألا إن من كان قبلكم من آل الكتاب افترقوا على ثنتين وسبعين ملة وإن هذه الأمة ستفترق على ثلاث وسبعين ملة اثنتان وسبعون في النار وواحدة في الجنة وهي الجماعة 
The Prophet ﷺ mentioned indeed before you from the people of the book those who separate into 72, 72 groups and indeed this Ummah was split into 73 groups 72 in the Hellfire and one in the Paradise and that one is the Jama'ah وَقَدْ أَخْبَرَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ سَلَّمْ بِإِفْتِرَاكِ أُمَّتِهِ عَلَى ثَلَاثٍ وَسَبْعِينَ فِرْقَةٍ إثنتان وسبعون في النار وواحدة في الجنة والتي في الجنة هي التي قال عنها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وما أنا عليه وأصحابي. The Sheikh says indeed the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم informed us of the separation of his ummah into seventy three groups or sects. Seventy two will be in the hellfire and one will be in the paradise. The one that will be in the paradise, it is the one which the Prophet Sallallahu said concerning them, those who are upon what me and my companions are on. The Shaykh he mentioned in commenting on this point, and this is not in the book, he said, كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ يَفْهَمُونَ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ خَطَأً وَيَكُولُونَ أَنَّ هَؤُلَا مُخَلَّدُونَ فِي النَّارِ وَلَيْسَ هَذَا صَحِيحًا The Shaykh said, many from amongst the people they understand this hadith in a wrong way. They say that these individuals will be in the hellfire forever, but this is not correct. Meaning from the 72 groups. Some people say, no, these people are going to be in the hellfire forever, and this is not correct. And if I am not mistaken, this is one of the mistakes of the brother Bilal Phillips in the Islamic studies books. Years ago, I remember when, when I had him, at the time, you know, we was taken from him, and I came across him, no, that, 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 that's not correct, and I highlighted it, but I remember reading what the ulama said about him, that these groups are Muslims, but uh, Bilal had mentioned that, um, that these individuals will abide in hell forever, they won't come out. Nah, that's it, that's a mistake. Yes. Can you repeat what you just said? About the hadith, the hadith yes. of the seventy-three sects. Oh, you said seventy-three sects. Seventy-two on the fire, one in paradise. Oh, that the, was from the seventy-three different sects. From the Muslims, from this <coughs> ummah, from, from the prophets ummah. Mm-hmm. Seven, the seventy-two that will be in the fire, they are Muslims. Those seventy-two groups that deviated, they are Muslims. They didn't leave Islam. The prophet saying that they will be in the fire, meaning those from amongst them who will go to hellfire, they will be in there temporarily, and then they will come out eventually. The shaykh is saying that some people misunderstood this hadith to mean that the 72 groups that will enter into the fire, that they will be in the hellfire forever as if they are disbelievers. But that's not the case. That's not correct. Nah. Thank you. You're welcome. We're in... We're وَإِنَّ مِنْ أَسْبَابِ حَلَاكِ الْأُمَّمَ السَّابِقَةِ هُوَ التَّفَرُّقِ وَكَثْرَةُ الْإِخْتِلَافِ لَا سِيَمَ الْإِخْتِلَافِ الْكِتَابِ الْمُنَزَّلَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَقَدْ حَذَّرَنَا وَقَدْ حَذَّرَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ فَقَالَ ذَرُونِي مَا تَرَدْتُكُمْ فَإِنَّمَا هَلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ بِكَثْرَةِ سُؤَالِهِمْ وَاخْتِلَافِهِمْ عَلَى أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ فَإِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ أَنْ شَيْءٍ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ وَإِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِأَمْنٍ فَأْتُمْ مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, the, the Shaykh he says, indeed from the causes of the destruction of the previous nations, it was due to their separation and their constant differing. Especially differing in relation to the book that was sent down upon them. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu warned us against this. Why did he warn us? So that we don't fall into the error that the previous nations fell into and then become destroyed of the previous nations. That's why the Prophet warned. The Prophet Sallallahu warning against the people of innovation, warning against sin, warning against shirkers for the protection of the Muslims. Not to cause separation that is blameworthy. The Prophet said, Leave me with that which I have left you with. For indeed, that which has destroyed those who were before you is the excessive question. 
And they're differing with their prophets. So when I command you to do something, F1. When I prohibit you from something, keep away from it. And when I command you to do something, do of it as much as you are able to. The scholars, they say, quoting or explaining this part of this narration, excessive questioning, meaning like the questioning of Bani Israel, of Musa, what kind of cow, what color, the cow, that type of questioning, because they didn't want to carry out the commandment. As Allah mentioned, they was not about to carry it out. And differing from their prophets, meaning the rules and regulations that were brought, they, they opposed them. So when I prohibit you from something, keep away from it. Meaning that everyone has the ability to keep away from the prohibitions. And when I command you to do something, do of it as much as you're able to. As much as you're able to because not everyone has the ability to carry out the commandments. Because commandments or the carrying out of the commandments are based upon capability. Right? Not everyone can pray standing. Not everyone can pay the zakat. Not everyone can make hajj. But everyone can keep away from zina. But everyone can keep away from drinking khamr. Right? But everyone can keep away from stealing. Everyone can keep away from lying. It's simple, just don't do it. وَإِنَّ طَرِيقَ الْخَلَاصِ مِنَ الْفُرْقَةِ وَالْإِخْتِلَافِ هُوَ بِاعْتِبَاءِ طَرِيقِ الْفِرْقَةِ النَّاجِيَةِ الْمَنْصُورَةِ وَهِيَ الْجَمَاعَةِ وَهُمُ الَّذِينَ يَسِيرُونَ عَلَى وَفْقِ مَنْهَجِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَأَصْحَابِهِ لَا يَعْدِلُونَ عَن ذَلِكَ ولا يحيدون عنه إن طريق الخلاص هو اتباع السلف الصالح قولا وعملا واعتقادا وعدم مخالفتهم أو الشذوذ عنهم. The Sheikh mentioned indeed the path to save oneself from separation and differing it is by way of following the path of the saved supported group and that group is the jama'ah and they are the ones who traverse upon that which is in agreement with the methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions and they do not deviate or sway away from that they don't leave that off why? because as soon as you sway away from the methodology of the Prophet you are on the path of destruction so the person who knows the truth in the correctness of the methodology of the Prophet and the Sahaba, that individual is not going to leave off that which is correct for that which is incorrect. Why would somebody leave off of that which is better for that which is worse? Except that that person has been deceived by the shaitan. And we know that shaitan beautifies evil. How can you go from honoring and respecting the scholars to now you speak ill of them? How? SubhanAllah bihamni. It's amazing. Individual call upon Salafiyya, yani Jadda. Calling through Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. The next thing you know, you know these innovators, they're fine, they're okay. So, what happened? Individual has become a victim of the shaitan. He's a victim. Without a doubt. So indeed, the path of safety and salvation and ridding oneself from going astray is following the Salaf al in statements and actions and in creed. And not differing with them and swing away or straying from their path. Call Allah Ta'ala, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِكِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّ وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Allah said, whoever opposes the messenger after guidance has been made clear, 
and he follows the way other than the way of the believers, we will turn him to that which he turned himself to and burn him in hell with an evil abode. So here the threat here is for the one who opposes the messenger after the guidance has been made clear. Meaning the person knows better. Because Allah mentions it. After the guidance has been made clear. Not that, that the person is ignorant, he don't know. Allah doesn't punish the people who are ignorant, who don't have the ability to know. No. The one who knows and then he deviates. The one who knows and then he stays upon his position of false. So this individual is under the threat. And then he follows a way other than the way of the believers. Because the believers, they didn't impose the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after guidance was made clear. No, after the guidance was made clear, they followed. And the believers here, they are the sahaba. As the shaykh mentioned, mu'minin sahaba wa atba'uhum min al Al Mahdiyin bi Ihsan who was Sabirun Naja and therefore the following of the path of the believers and they are the companions and their followers from the rightly guided Imams, following them in goodness, this is the path of salvation. Inshallah Ta'ala, we will stop at this point. And whatever is correct, the praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Whatever is incorrect, it is from myself. سبحانك الله وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك